I'm really excited to be here this afternoon to talk about one of my favorite subjects and really my passion for gardening is in gardens that give back to people and to pollinators and wildlife. And that is a growing trend that we're seeing all around America now with 35% of Americans now growing some of their own food. Since the pandemic, there's two different surveys that are out that actually show uh, that, that up to 20 million new gardeners um, have found the hobby as a result of being home more often. Now, the second form of gardening that has gained popularity is actually in those wanting to grow edible plants. In fact, we've seen a 63% increase in edible gardening by millennials. Uh, there's different reasons why folks may be into that, whether it's different social and environmental issues. Certainly we were talking about equity earlier, food waste. I wrote an article for Edible DFW last year uh, that digs deeper into that. But unfortunately, um, there's a large portion of food in, in North Central Texas that gets sent to the landfill without actually being consumed. And so if we grow food uh, on our own homes and landscapes, typically we're more likely to eat that food. Uh, then food uh, security. So, uh, you know, there are un unfortunately food deserts around our area and if we can teach people how to grow their own food, likely um, they they're have better access and their neighbors have better access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, I want to talk a little bit about food transport miles. A lot of people don't realize that on average fruits and vegetables travel about 1200 miles to get to our doorstep. Yeah. If you're buying organic, which I like to do sometimes, it's on average 1300 miles. And there's a lot of fossil fuels and water and other natural resources to go through uh, in that transport. But wasted water is one that I'll dig into deeper as we progress. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, up to a third of our water footprint can be attributed to wasted food um, and 80% and of, of our water as a whole goes to agriculture, growing crops that are going to feed us or, or provide a shelter. And then because we live in one of the fastest growing areas in not only the state but the country, we have an increase in land that we can't use for farming practices anymore. And so if you're growing food on your own property, you're kind of taking back some of that land for smaller scale agriculture. Uh, which is definitely a part of, of the solution. Now, each year or every two years, the American Society of Landscape Architects does a survey where these landscape architects are asking their customers what do they want in a landscape design. Now, generally, the trends we've seen lately are people want landscapes that are more environmentally sustainable. They want to reduce water costs. Nobody wants to pay those high summer water bills, and they want landscapes that are lower maintenance. Now that's twofold. A lot of times the millennials that are first time home buyers, they don't have the much desire to go out there and trim their hedges or you know to maintain that perfect lawn. They want landscapes that are easier for them and the busy lives that they, uh, they all uh, have. But also we have kind of the baby boomer generation that is transitioning away from higher maintenance landscapes as they retire they, they want to enjoy their landscapes and the beauty and less so the physical activity of planting those high maintenance plants. So we'll talk about different ways we can do that. One of those is by planting native plants, uh, you know, low maintenance landscapes, landscapes that are efficient with water, uh, reduced lawn area. But 70% of Americans now are interested in growing their own food and vegetables as well as incorporating rainwater harvesting, a subject that is, is kind of apropos to today's weather. 60% uh, almost are interested in organic gardens and then composting is very popular as well. We'll talk about kind of holistically how that fits into gardening for people and, and pollinators. Now definitely we want to give back with our gardens both to the earth in our community one way that you can do that is to make your garden a certified wildlife habitat. And really, when you put that signage in your yard, that encourages your neighbors and your community to do the same. We'll talk about three different programs as we kind of wrap up today. Also, if you're growing food, you may want to donate fresh produce to your local food bank or perhaps to share with your neighbors. 
we're really lucky to live in a community where a lot of people have gardens and you know on the next door group or the facebook group it's easy to say hey you know i have some extra tomatoes or you know whatever we're harvesting onions this week to make sure that that food doesn't get wasted and that people get get uh, healthy nutritious food but we can also use natural ways to get rid of rid of weeds and control pests and not only is that beneficial for us and the pollinators and the food we eat but it also protects our water resources when we do get rain we don't have as many uh, kind of toxic chemicals or synthetic chemicals heading down our, our watershed. We definitely like to include plants that attract pollinators, and I promise we'll talk about specific plants today, and, and maybe some tips to help design your garden with wildlife in mind. A lot of times we think about plantings as three-dimensional with the different layers and colors and textures of the foliage, but there really is that fourth dimension that goes beyond the plants themselves if you plant it, they will come. And will, what I mean by they is the bees and the butter, butterflies and hummingbirds, but also lizards and turtles. And it's really neat to see and spend time in your landscapes and enjoy all of that activity, as well as the beautiful blooms and the foliage of the trees. Now, unfortunately, there are some challenges to growing plants in Texas. And certainly we've seen that in this past year with extreme temperatures, not only extreme cold events but extreme heat events we know even though it's been a cool spring so far we're going to see temperatures exceeding 90 and 100 degrees before too long and really it takes a special plant to be able to withstand negative four degrees as well as 113 degrees which we can certainly see uh you know periodically here getting the plants planted where they they have access to the right amount of sunlight is certainly one of those challenges Weeds compete with our plants for not only water, but also sunlight and nutrients. Why don't we talk about maybe some weeds that have some benefits we can eat and pollinators can use, and then pests. Now, many people think about pests being, being insects as a whole, but for the most part, up to 80% of insects are either beneficial or benign. It's really just a small amount of insects that actually do damage to our crops where that would exceed, you know, the levels where we couldn't actually use them. Pests also include uh, different weeds or plants out of place, perhaps invasive or noxious weeds, and then diseases, uh, you know, viruses, bacteria problems can be pests too. Uh, and then water is a growing issue. And I say water is a growing issue, kind of tongue in cheek, pun intended, because it is the most limiting factor to reducing plant growth. If plants don't have water, then it doesn't matter how many nutrients they have or whatever uh, you know minerals that they need, um, they're not going to be successful. So we want to make sure we give them enough water without providing too much water. That's a little bit harder this week than, than some. Now, we know that droughts are, are part of the Texas climate. In fact, we even see if we look at the drought record and, and you know, the predictions for drought in the future, we could go up to a decade where we see less than 50% of our average rainfall. Here in North Central Texas, we get about 36 inches of rain on average. So we want to make sure that we're planting plants that grow well in that, but we may see as little as 18 inches of rainfall in a year, you know, less than half of, of what our plants naturally uh, would need to survive. And so uh, there are times that we want to supplementally irrigate our landscapes and, and certainly we would encourage folks to do that if it's gone you know two weeks without rain we want to make sure those plants stay healthy um, but we want to make sure that also we're planting plants that can withstand that drought and we're not planting you know different flowers or trees or shrubs that need 80 inches of rainfall in order to to survive because we're not going to get that in most years although some years we can. Now, one of those issues that we talked about in terms of sustainability is a rapidly growing population. In fact, the Texas Water Development Board estimates that we'll have 51 million people in Texas. The EPA estimates 54 million people in Texas by 2030. Uh, and that is really kind of some, some shocking numbers as we see uh, those trends growing. We also see that our water supplies our water resources that we get from our local lakes and reservoirs are continuing to decline. So we have that rapidly growing population. We have water supplies because of aging infrastructure. Our lakes are building up with sediment and, 
and you know as erosion happens from the new development in our landscapes that bare soil a little bit of it ends up in the bottom of our lake and over 50 60 years our lakes are filled up with soil at the bottom so they can hold less water um, and so that's part of that aging infrastructure that, that creates a challenge I mentioned how food and water uh, kind of touches together, but food makes up about two thirds of our water footprint in general. So that's really a, a large portion of the water that we use. And if we can conserve that at home by growing some of our own food, then, then we can reduce our water footprint. Now, most of us around DFW look and we see the dominant landscape plant material are lawns. In fact, it is the fourth largest crop by acreage in the country, the first, the largest irrigated crop in the country, but it doesn't really give back. Unless you have a, you know, a goat or a rabbit, you're really not getting any food value for that lawn. And so we want to consider getting rid of some of our lawn, perhaps maybe reducing it to about a third of our landscapes. Generally, we practice the rule of thirds where we try to reduce our lawn area and plant up to a third of our landscapes in native perennials. So shrubs and trees and flowers that are going to come back year after year and provide value to us for ornamental value as well as value for wildlife. And then we'd like to have areas that kind of connect us to those spaces. So it could be pathways or borders, it could be uh, arroyos or dry river beds. But about a third of our landscape could be patios or pervious hardscape. So those, rather than concrete, allow the water to infiltrate into our soils where our plants can take advantage. In times like this, they actually can reduce localized floodings that we see in our community. So as I dig in deeper and talk about specific plants, the kind of the overarching holistic mission that we promote at Rooted In is landscape CPR. The C in that acronym is conservation. So we want to conserve water, soil, energy, as well as enhance our habitat and the ecological functions of our urban areas. The P is permeability. So we want to disconnect those impermeable services like our rooftops, our driveways, our sidewalks, and as much as possible, try to slow spread and sink the rain into our landscapes where our plants can take advantage and also, as it works like a sponge, sending less water downstream to cause flooding problems. If we create soil that is biologically active with microbes and healthy fungi and microorganisms, that helps our soil work like a sponge. The R is retention. So really the ultimate goal is to hold water onto the property for the benefits of the soil, the plants, and creating habitat. One way we can do that is through rain gardens, perhaps through cisterns, where we can allow the water to sink in and eliminate that runoff as much as possible. Now, one way we can do that is through native and adapted plants. And anytime I talk about native and adapted plants, folks think, oh, we're talking about cacti and yucca and rocks and landscapes that look like this. And, and certainly, I think landscapes, uh, the xeriscapes have their place that may be better suited to Arizona or Utah or places where they get less than 18 inches of rainfall. Now, where we get 36 inches of rainfall, we want to show folks you can grow lush, vibrant landscapes that have a variety of colors and textures that ultimately are going to use less water, less fertilizers, less pesticides. Um, we recommend native and adapted plants. Native, they're from here. They evolved in our sometimes harsh and unpredictable climate. Adapted plants are not from here, but they got here as quick as they could. We want to make sure we steer clear of invasive plants, but there are a lot of species that actually thrive in our soils with our rainfall, can do well if we get freezing temperatures or extreme heat. And there are actually quite a few edible plants that fill that niche as well. And we'll talk about those uh, here kind of moving forward. So the case for natives, they are adapted to our soils. They're adapted to our stream weather. They also provide food and shelter for our native bees, our native butterflies, and our native birds. And so really native should be the focus. I always will recommend a native plant if it can fill that role in the ecosystem. Now about 75% of the plants that we recommend through our plant database that rooted in in our classes are natives, but you know, there's about a fourth of them that are adapted plants that really do a great job as well as looking looking great and, and uh, being water efficient 
adapting to our soils, what have you. And ultimately, that's going to save you time and money. Now, the other thing I think selfishly about gardening for pollinators is they put us back in touch with the land we live on, the people around us, and they bring our landscapes to life with activity. And I think that's something fun for the whole family to enjoy. We do want to make sure that we're choosing plants that are adapted to both our macro environment and our micro environment. So our macro environment is kind of what our environment is as a whole. On average, it's, it's part of it is our hardiness zone. And so on average, we get down to about 10 to 15 degrees are the lowest temperatures we see here in zone 8A. That means that if we're buying plants from the nursery, we want to make sure that the bulk of the plant material we're buying is going to come back year after year, no matter what the freezing weather we get. If we buy plants that are cold hardy to 7B or to 7A or 6B, they're going to be cold hardy to those extreme outlying events that we get like we, we saw here in February. Also, we want to make sure that if we're looking at the plant tags, that they're adaptable to our soil type and pH. Most of us in North Central Texas have heavy clay soils, poor drainings that tend to be higher pH. If you're not familiar with pH, it's basically we have alkaline soils, which are the opposite of acidic oils, that, uh, soils rather, that we see further East Texas. And then water, making sure that we plant plants that are adaptable to our water regime, which again runs from kind of the 18 inches of rainfall to the 80 inches of rainfall, but on average we get about 36. Our microenvironment is also important. That's our environment locally, maybe your side of the house, maybe uh, you know affecting how much sunlight or shade that a plant gets, different buildings and structures are nearby, those driveways and sidewalks we talked about that create heat island effects, and then maybe localized irrigation. You may have uh, easy access to irrigation in some spots of your landscape, but not others, and that may drive what plants you put in, in what spots. Now, I mentioned our website, which is rootedin.com, and a lot of what we try and do is provide free resources to the public. In addition to classes like this one that you can sign up for uh, online, we teach now some in-person outdoor classes uh, safely, uh, recommended for, for folks that have been vaccinated or uh, that can safely wear a mask. But we also teach a lot of virtual classes, uh, just basically teaching people how they can grow more lush, vibrant, small landscapes and vegetable gardens, as well as rainwater harvesting and, and irrigation programs. But we also have free resources to help people choose the right plants. And that's one of the examples we have here. This is our top 100 landscape plants for North Texas. In addition to having our favorite uh, shrubs and trees and, and uh, different, even some edible plants and there, we have uh, how big the plant gets, what time of year it blooms, what uh, color it blooms, what pollinators or wildlife are attracted to those blooms, if the plant's evergreen, deciduous, um, even what role you may want to plant that plant in the landscape, whether it's a specimen or maybe a border plant or a mass planting, what have you. So that kind of goes hand in hand with attracting pollinators to our landscape choosing plants should not be just about their their beauty that they provide to us but what other ecosystem services that can they provide if we want to attract pollinators to our landscape we need to kind of hit the big three that create our habitat and that is providing food water and shelter for a number of of wildlife that that call our our north texas area home now we are focusing on pollinators today, but if you plant for pollinators, there's a lot of different wildlife that you're going to see and attract. And, and maybe for, for me, I'm a new dad, I have a two-year-old, and just teach her all the exciting things about gardening and, and you know, bees and butterflies uh, and eating some of our own food. Really, I think it's, it's kind of an added level of gardening that is, that is fun for the whole family. Now, if we're talking about edible plants that are good for people and pollinators too, we may want to expand our edible palate. And basically, that means that we may want to eat some stuff that, that people have been eating for thousands of years, but here in America and, and kind of Dallas, you know, North Central Texas area, we may have lost that value or lost the knowledge that, hey, this is something that, that you can eat and taste delicious. It can also help us make sure our gardens look the best 
they can year round, planting food with an eye for beauty overall. I do want to kind of tick that warning. Um, not all plants are edible, so you, you maybe uh, need to, to double check and make sure that it is edible before you put that in your mouth. Many native plants have toxic lookalikes, uh, so get to know those. Let's say if you're eating uh, a plant that, that we talk about today that happens to be in your yard that does have edible value, well, for sure, make sure that that plant is exactly the plant that I'm talking about it. The key there is to refer to the botanical name. Uh, there's lots of plants that have the same common name. If we're going to eat a plant, we need to know, yes, it has the same uh, botanical name as the edible plant. One of my favorite resources for that is Edible and Useful Plants of Texas in the Southwest. That's by Delana Toll. You can probably check that out from, from your local library. Uh, there's also some websites that have some information if you want to dig deeper to the subject today. One of those is foragingtexas.com. The other one is eattheweeds.com. These both talk about native plants as well as traditional landscape plants that have edible value. Um, and then there's another one, wildmansteveville.com. It's interesting, a guy that kind of made some, some national attention foraging over the years. There's also a great blog called Hunger, Hunger and Thirst for Life Blogspot. Now, in addition uh, to knowing which plant is right, you want to know if that plant has been sprayed with anything. So avoid eating any plant that has been sprayed with chemicals or pesticides, if there's Heavy traffic, like for vehicles, could there be a concern with heavy metals? Or maybe if it's an old house and there's paint chipping off of it, could there be lead in that area of the soil? And just because a plant is edible does not mean it will taste good. I'll talk about a lot of plants today, I promise. And some of them, somebody may think, oh, this is delicious. I love this plant. I've got to include it on my plate, you know, every meal. And some people will remain like, I don't really care for it. Just like not everybody likes Brussels sprouts. Not everybody maybe is going to like Yopon Holly tea. It's all a matter of taste, but again, make sure you know the plant and you can positively identify it before you put it into your mouth. Now, we also need to think a little bit about, uh, about an acronym that is uh, described as item. So once we identify the plant, make sure it's the right time of year to harvest. So that we actually know if we go to the grocery store, what's in season and what's not in season. And when it's out of season, the quality is not as good. In fact, it may even taste bitter or perhaps have some, some uh, toxic components. So that's also something to keep in mind. Pay attention to the environment. I have kind of a funny sign here, but the, the fecal bacteria from cats and dogs are one of the largest contributors uh, to pollution. And it can happen in our own vegetable gardens in our own backyard, so I'm not harvesting any dandelions or, or you know, edible plants for people and pollinators if, if my dogs have had access to that area. And then the method of preparation is also important. So uh, there's certain certain foods at the grocery store. I'll talk about one, you know, dried beans. You, you just wouldn't want to eat dried beans. Dried beans are actually toxic, but we know that if we cook, cook, cook them, they're fantastic and they're a staple for all of us and everybody knows to eat those. Well, if you're eating plants from your yard, you also may want to make sure that you know that method of proper uh, preparation, rather. So where can you look? You can look in your own backyard for conventional vegetables, fruits and nuts, or edible flowers, or even weeds. You can also look in nearby meadows and abandoned lots, or maybe near a stream, a creek, or pond, or a trail to find plants. And really, edible plants are everywhere. You just need to make sure that you have permission uh, before you're going to harvest those, whether it's from a public park or from maybe a neighbor's landscape, make sure you, you have permission. Now, we like to use as much as possible edible plants in our landscapes uh, that have a benefit to us. They can be used as low hedges, as borders, as background plants. They can fill empty spaces in sunny spots or in shady spots, and they can be used for their flowers, their flavor, or their scent. One of them that is interesting this time of year is the red bud. So red buds are a tree that is a traditional landscape plant, but it also happens to be a native plant that will grow in, in our wild areas as well as parks and in all types of public spaces. Now, the, the flowers of the red bud are beneficial to birds and to butterflies. 
It's actually a host of the Henry's elfin bird butterfly, uh, which is what it's pictured here. But this is what its larva looks like, a very beautiful little caterpillar. Uh, and so it does provide a lot of benefit for pollinators. Birds actually eat the flowers. This is the seed pods I may have mentioned. Um, but the flowers are edible to humans as well. In fact, on salads, they are delicious. They taste like peas. Uh, you could also fry them up with a little butter or salt. So um, this is a plant that looks great. It's water efficient, it's native, and it's good for butterflies as well as birds and bees. Uh, this is what they look like when they bloom in the spring. Uh, again, you can eat the buds. Right now, you can actually eat the young pods. So because it's in the pea family, um, the pods taste very similar to peas. Now, they're a little starchy, so you don't want to eat them raw, but if you cook them in a skillet, again, with a little oil and salt, they are fantastic. It's really like a two or three day window when they're at their prime, when they first kind of emerge, they're very tender, and then after they stay on the tree, the pods get a little tough. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, but it, a great plant um, that looks great as well as tastes great. Now, hackberry is another plant that has some, some uh, value for butterflies as well as humans. It is the larval host of the question mark, the morning cloak, and American snout. It also produces a seed that has kind of a pulpy co cover sweet. To me, it tastes like fruit roll-ups. Uh, songbirds and small mammals love to eat it, different species of wildlife. But it's also great for humans as a snack. It was initially used in, uh, you may have heard of pemmican, but where uh, Native Americans and, and early pioneers would, would uh, beat and, and uh, dry down dehydrate jerky and then put nuts, sometimes acorns, and then also mix some fruit with it. And so that would last a long time. Not that anybody's going to be making their own pemmican, but hackberries are delicious and uh, you can actually um, make jelly from them if you wanted to, or just kind of use them as a trail snack. Another great food for people and pollinators is the Texas persimmon. They are the larval host of the gray hair streak as well as the Henry's elfin butterfly. They provide a nectar source for a number of other butterflies, and then they provide food um, for many species of wildlife, including humans. So if you wait until they're black and fully ripe, to me, they taste like uh, a cross between maybe chocolate and a date. Um, so, so good to eat. You need to make sure that they're ripe, though. You don't want to eat them underripe, or they can be a bit uh, bitter or ac acrid. There's also another persimmon that is native to our area. This one is the larval host of the Luna moth. Uh, it also uh, is, is edible for different birds and small mammals as well as humans. So this is the, the what a Luna moth looks like, a beautiful, beautiful a butterfly that a lot of folks in North Texas have been spotting lately. Uh, this is this is a quote from John Smith of Jamestown, fame, one of the, the early pioneers of America. If a persimmon is not ripe, it will draw a man's mouth awry with much torrent. So uh, most persimmons have to be as soft as a ripe banana in order to eat. If they're not, they, they are very tannic and acrid, and you only make that mistake once. But it's funny that I, I don't think I have this in the slide. Let me go back one. Oh, there it is. Americans for Simon Dios Pyros. Actually, uh, they loosely translated in Greek is the food of the gods. And so um, somebody thought highly enough to name it that. And, and I have one of these planted in my, my own landscape, and it is just a fantastic, fantastic plant. There's also... Um, Richland Park in Richardson, not too far from Richland, where they have these planted all throughout uh, the park, and you can go, I mean, 30 trees or so, and you can go forage these uh, if you're interested. But again, great nectar source for butterflies, a host species for butterflies, and uh, is food that is edible and delicious. Uh, they're typically ripe in the fall. This is some my wife and I harvested last year. We made persimmon preserves. And then uh, we also made persimmon uh, pudding for Thanksgiving, which is a bread pudding that was traditionally served at Thanksgiving even 100, 200 years ago. Chicken and oak. So I mentioned some people eat oak acorns, which are actually a nut. Um, and uh, they're actually mildly tannic. Uh, so some of them you can eat fresh. Most of them you'd actually have to leach the water and leach those 
tannins off in order to get some of those sweeter, kind of nut, nuttier, kind of hazelnut-like flavors. Um, but they are an acorn that has been bred. There's a couple different uh, cultivars, Sergeant Oak, number one, where people have bred them to be more edible. Um, some people will actually grind them up and run them through a coffee maker in order to leach, uh, maybe two or three times to leach some of those tannins off. And people use acorn flour. In fact, it's something you can buy now. They're also the larval host of the gray hair streak, and oak trees in general support many other insect species, really more than, than any tree. So and they're also very well adapted to North Central Texas, again, the larval host of the gray hair streak. Cinizo, or Texas sage, this is a plant that's used as a landscape plant. It's actually native to South Texas, but it's the larval host of the Fiona checker spot, as well as the Coletta silk moth provides nectar source for uh, butterflies, native and European bees. Every time it rains, you'll see these flush out again during the summer, just completely covered in blooms. Beautiful, beautiful shrubs, landscape shrubs. Bumblebees love them. Um, but they actually have historically been used to treat uh, symptoms of colds or allergies. So Georgianne and I were just talking about allergies bothering us today. Uh, but sometimes people will make a tea from the leaves that are, are believed to help treat congestion, fever, and coughing. Again, I'm not a medical professional. I'm a horticulturist. So you definitely want to check with your doctor before using any plants like this. But it is something that where, where chemists and scientists have studied uh, the benefits, and, and so that may be something worth digging deeper into. Another plant that's of interest for people and pollinators are the purple passion flower. I have a lot of these planted in my own backyard. They're a great nectar source for butterflies, and native as well as European bees. They're the larval host of the Gulf or Mex Mexican fritillary butterfly. So if you see a little caterpillar on there, a bright orange caterpillar, that's what those are. The fruits are also edible for humans as well as small mammals. You may have heard the term passion fruit. Well, that's what, what this is right here. Cut them open right when they get about to this wrinkle point um, about the same time the persimmons are ripe in the fall you'll see this and uh, that kind of gelatinous seed is very sweet and tropical tasting so maybe you get flavors of like a mango or a papaya uh, a little bit sour if you let them get get riper they tend to be sweeter um, but is a delicious delicious fruit that is is it's great for humans as well as as pollinators, some people actually make a tea from the leaves. In fact, most health food stores or Whole Foods or you know, sprouts you go to actually have a bedtime tea that is made from a uh, passiflora or a passion vine uh, that is a very mild sedative. It just kind of is calming and, and lets folks uh, sleep a little bit. This is another plant. It's native to, uh, to, to Texas and North Central Texas. It's also the host of some skipper butterflies, but uh, the seed heads look like oats, which is how it gets the name Inland Sea Oats. And uh, even though the seeds are very, very small, they aren't edible. And if you remove the chaff or the outer part by winnowing, and you can kind of Google how to winnow, uh, but basically you're just passing them back and forth until you get only the seed and not the dry outer coating. Uh, but they've been an in, in, in ingredient used to make bread. Now, now the caveat there is, You'd have to winnow a lot to get enough to make a bread, but they could easily be a component of bread, so you could add a little bit. Or some people are actually even making beer from these to get the fermentable sugars, and in that case, you wouldn't have to remove the chaff because through that fermentation process, the, the sugars can, can be extracted out of, out of the seeds. Uh, purple cone flowers and echinacea are just starting to bloom now. We have three echinacea species in Texas that are all been used to treat a variety of different medical conditions. They help with inflammation. Again, I'm not a medical professional, so talk to your doctor before using echinacea, but a lot of different data on there to support uh, its benefits, perhaps with headaches, perhaps for uh, just with helping with brain function. Also are the larval host of the bordered patch as well as the, the silvery checker spot. You'll see different bees and butterflies using them as a nectar source. Just a really, really uh, a beautiful flower for the landscape. Another plant uh, that is beneficial for people and pollinators is the prickly ash, also known as the toothache tree, native to Texas in our area. And it is a close relative of the Szechuan or Szechuan pepper. If you ever eat 
uh, Szechuan cuisine, which here in Richardson, we have uh, a number of different Szechuan restaurants that are so, so good. I love, love Szechuan fried chicken. Uh, but they actually will use the little peppercorns from this, and it, they add a lot of traditional peppers, which are very, very spicy, but also the Szechuan peppers, which numb your tongue. In fact, it has a chemical inside there that is similar to Novocaine that kind of has that numbing feature. Uh, it also happens to be the host of uh, the eastern giant swallowtail. Uh, some people call this the bird poop cat caterpillar. I wouldn't call it that, but some people do. Uh, but it actually kind of does look like some bird droppings on the leaf, which is more of a uh, kind of a, uh, a, a camouflage for them. Uh, but this is a great tree. Maybe if you have a large area, probably not a landscape tree. You've got really interesting bark there. Uh, but is is a is a great tree, and this is what the adult butterfly actually looks like. Sumac, or sometimes pronounced su sumac, by our, our Middle Eastern friends, you may have eaten this on top of uh, hummus or other uh, kind of Mediterranean delicacies. Um, it is uh, a plant that we have. It has a large species uh, and or a number of species in the genus, rather, and we have uh, several of those here in North Central Texas in the fall. They produce these seed heads, and it's kind of a hairy coating on the outside of those seeds that are ground into a spice. And I actually have some I foraged last year. Uh, the flowers are also beneficial for bees and butterflies, uh, but it's just a really pretty plant. Some people use it to make a lemonade, so it does have uh, kind of some edible value making a drink as well as, as a spice. Pecan. Uh, we would be remiss if we didn't mention probably the most popular edible plant uh, for people and pollinators. It is the larval host of the red banded hair streak. Uh, birds and mammals use the food fruit, which is an involucre. Uh, some people confuse it with a nut, um, but uh, it's delicious, delicious around pies, um, you know, certainly, and then and then does have benefit to wildlife as well. This is what the imbalukri looks like. It's basically has a husk and it splits open. The walnuts do the same thing. Speaking of walnuts, this is what they're starting to look like right now. Uh, walnuts are the larval host of, of hair streak butterflies. You'll see them in the blooms kind of as a nectar source. Uh, some Sometimes they have the male catkins and the, the female flowers. Um, but the, uh, the fruits on them actually look like limes hanging from the tree. But if you bust them open, uh, inside this kind of black tarry looking coating is a very meaty, delicious uh, fruit. And um, to me, they taste like a cross between a pecan or a pine nut. They're extremely thick shelled and hard to get into. They're a hard uh, nut to crack, <laughs> as they say, but, uh, but delicious, delicious, and, and again, good for, for people and pollinators. Another great, this is a landscape shrub, very common, is the yopon holly. Now, I would tell you, don't eat the, the berries on this one. The berries are toxic, mildly toxic, um, but they are toxic. But the leaves are actually used as a caffeinated tea, and they have been for thousands of years. Um, uh, you know, in fact, you can go to most grocery stores, actually, and find a tea made from yopon holly. It's the larval host of the Henry's Elfin. It also does produce small flowers, uh, the females do, uh, that are a great nectar source for a number of our native bees and butterflies, but they're evergreen, and so you can harvest the leaves year round. Uh, you can actually roast the leaves in your own oven to make a tea. Just look online and find, find a recipe. Uh, there's a number of different uh, you know, stories the journalists have done about the, the benefits of America's forgotten native tea. And in fact, uh, Cat Spring Yopon, I, most central markets and, and uh, what's the other one? Central market and Whole Foods actually have some type of Yopon tea. If you're not as adventurous to actually uh, make your own, you can, you can buy that product already made. Another great uh, plant for people and pollinators is the wax myrtle. In fact, the leaves of a wax myrtle can use be used interchangeably as bay leaf. It also happens to be the larval host of a hair streak butterfly. And then uh, the flowers, before they give rise to the, the waxy fruit, are a nectar source for a number of bees and butterflies. Uh, in fact, you probably have tried wax myrtle, if, if you knew it or not. It's actually an ingredient used in most shrimp boils. 
Um, so if you, if you look on the, the, the uh, ingredients there, you'll see the wax myrtle or some type of myrtle on there, closer related species. Uh, a lot of people uh, uh, burn bayberry candles uh, around the holidays. They kind of smell like Christmas and bayberry candles uh, use a, a close relative uh, that is native to kind of the Northeast, the same genus Myrica. Uh, this is another plant that I absolutely love. If you have lots of shade, uh, you may check this one out, American Beautyberry. Um, it is uh, a great plant, shrub, produces edible fruit, as well as nectar source for bees and butterflies. My wife and I love to make jelly from it or syrup, which is what you call jelly that doesn't set. Uh, sometimes people have, tr have trouble with the jelly setting on this, but it, the syrup's great for cocktails or on pancakes, and then the blooms, which we see this time if you're great for a number of, of, uh, of butterflies and bees. Autumn sage is another great one. It's a nectar source for, for hummingbirds and butterflies, as well as uh, it can be used as a spice. So it's a salvia, just like our culinary salvia. Um, and let me go back one, but it is actually used to season black beans in northern Mexico. So the leaves themselves, you can uh, throw them in black beans, kind of taste like oregano uh, somewhat. Uh, then the flowers themselves are edible. So if you pull the flowers from the calyx, you throw them in a cocktail, but they're very sweet and a little savory. Turk's cap, another plant that is great for birds and, and hummingbirds and butterflies. Uh, it's a hibiscus flower that you can uh, eat fresh. It tastes like a cucumber or the seeds that they produce uh, called the Turk's apple are actually um, edible. You can make jellies from them or, or just eat them raw. And this is kind of what they look like there. So Turk's cap has a fruit called an apple and it is edible as long with the flowers. Leatris, as we're kind of wrapping up here, uh, this is a plant that butterflies love. It's one of the best fall blooming plants. And really for the most part in your landscape, you should leave these for the butterflies. But a lot of people don't realize that the corms, so the roots are actually edible and they're starchy. Uh, you may wanna dig deeper into kind of how to prepare those. Sometimes they can be a little bit woody, uh, but historically, Native Americans use them. I would discourage people from going and digging these up in native areas to get the starch. But if you had a population of them in your landscape and you needed to divide them, well, you could try to eat a few and see if that was something that you enjoy. Another great tree is uh, the Mexican plum. It's a great alternative to Bradford pears, these beautiful white blooms in the spring. It's also the host of the Eastern tiger swallowtail which is really neat to see a nectar source for a number of our native bees and butterflies. But I selfishly love to eat the fruit. Uh, you wanna make sure the fruit are completely ripe so they're at their sweetest. Uh, that means you can harvest them when they soften from the tree, set them on the counter inside your home for a fruit few days until they soften a little bit more and try one. They're delicious for fresh eating or you can make a jellies or syrups out of them. And this is a picture of that. Eastern tiger swallowtail, uh, which calls them home. Another great native tree that grows in our area and, and towards central Texas is the honey mesquite. Fantastic for all different types of pollinators, bees and butterflies. Um, but actually it is a food source that a lot of Americans have forgotten about. Um, I wrote an article uh, about this for the Dallas Morning News uh, with a recipe on actually how to make the flower. Uh, but you can grind the whole seed pod with, when they're ripe and it's very sweet. It's actually a really good sugar source for diabetics um, that need uh, sugars with a low glycemic index. But this is kind of what they look like when they're at peak ripeness. And then I have a little video here, but basically I put these in my Vitamix blender and, uh, and make a flour into them. And that's kind of what it looks like sifted. You can cut that into any of your favorite uh, Biscuit recipes or bread recipes, wouldn't use it all, but cut it with traditional flours if you're using almond flour or perhaps traditional wheat flours. Uh, a number of herbs, so many of our herbs, European herbs and, and Mediterranean herbs are great for pollinators and people as well. Um, I wanna make sure we have time for questions, so I'm gonna kinda go through this. Uh, anise hyssop is a, a Native American herb that is fantastic for butterflies and bees with its bloom. Tastes like a cross between mint and kind of licorice. 
Basils look amazing as ornamental and are edible for people and pollinators. We see so many uh, native bees and butterflies using them. Mexican mint marigold tastes like tarragon. In fact, it's called Mexican tarragon, uh, but it blooms, these beautiful blooms in the fall. I love this for chicken salad, kicking up chicken salad, uh, a notch with the leaves, so, so good. And the flowers are great for cocktails. My wife and I like to kind of throw them in there. Uh, when they bloom and it's one of the fall bloomers for the migrating monarch butterflies uh, so so cool in that respect if you're looking for a tough native for full shade that thrives in full shade where nothing else will grow lyre leaf sage a native salvia you can eat the leaves as well as the blooms um, the pole plants completely edible and pollinators absolutely love it including butterflies and bees also, maybe plant some annual and some perennial flowers that are edible for, for butterflies and bees. Marigold, zinnias, pansies, dianthus, Mexican tarragon that we mentioned, as well as calendula are all edible that you're giving to yourself and you're also giving back for wildlife. Now, there are also some native flowers that you can grow that are edible, like goldenrod. In fact, some people believe goldenrod, it tastes a little like licorice, but the flowers actually help with allergies as well. Dewberries taste like blackberries. Their flowers have a hint of blackberries. Prickly pear, uh, cactus flowers are edible. Primrose are edible. In fact, they were they were um, believed to be eaten at the first Thanksgiving, uh, as well as our native violets, just like the, the violas uh, or the Johnny Jump Ups that we had on the other slide. Uh, black locust, one of our native trees, uh, those flowers are edible and nutty. Um, I would just caution folks, again, when we're talking about planting for people and pollinators, whether it's in your vegetable garden, in your landscape, or in wild areas, make sure that they're not sprayed with uh, fertilizers, or pesticides rather, and then fertilizers are applied in a responsible manner. Uh, we like to practice IPM, which is beneficial for the insect. Um, and, and really the goal with, with IPM is to identify any pest species and then when we control it, we want to make sure that we're using a sustainable practice. So whether that's physically removing the insect, using an organic insecticide, but if we are spraying something that we're not going to harm our pollinators or ourselves with those products. Now, some additional resources, uh, there's going to be one of the last few slides. I wanted to talk to people about iNaturalist. I don't have too, too much time to dig into it in detail. It's an app that you can find on your desktop or your phone. Check it out. You can learn every species of butterfly or bee or native pollinator uh, that we have indigenous here to North Central Texas. You also, if you want to learn more about the plants, you can check out the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, which has a database on every native plant that is a larval host for butterflies. You can find that in their special collections there. You can also find more information specifically on butterfly host species by visiting dallasbutterflies.com. And that is a website for the Dallas Lepidoptera Society. And they have, uh, you know, after COVID kind of ends and we start getting back to normal, they have in-person classes that you can take to learn more. And I've learned a lot from those folks. There's also some great books, um, Gardening for Wildlife by Kelly Conrad Bender. You can learn more or you can get your landscape certified through uh, monarchwatch.org, which helps you to certify your landscape as a monarch way station, or you can choose to look at the resources at the National Wildlife Federation, which can certify your landscape as a certified wildlife habitat. And then the new kid on the block here is Laura Bush's foundation, Texan by Nature, who also has a certification. We've been really blessed to be able to partner with them on some projects, and you can keep up with those uh, by following us on social media. Again, I'm Daniel Cunningham. Uh, we would love to answer any questions that you might have in the time we have available. Also, if you're running out of time, you don't have time to get your question answered today, you can follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, or on Twitter at RootedNTX. And we would love to answer any questions you might have, uh, or you can find up uh, more about our plant sales there as well. Thank you, Daniel. That was fantastic. And I know that we do have some questions in the Q&A, so we'll turn it over to Lori and let her ask. All right. 
Thanks so much, Daniel. We do, we have several questions. So the first one we have is back when you were talking about persimmons. Uh, Cindy wants to know what's the difference between an American and a Texas persimmon and how do you identify them? Yeah, so they're both the genus Diospiros or the, 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 the same genus as like the Asian persimmon. The Texas persimmon grows towards the hill country, kind of central Texas. It's used here as a landscape tree. Its fruits are darker black and tend to be smaller, and it tends to be a more compact tree, you know, maybe 10 to 15 feet or so. And then our American persimmon is actually native here to Dallas County. We see it along creeks, uh, and its fruit, excuse me, is a little bit bigger than orange, but both of them are delicious when ripe. Excellent. Um, thank you. And so um, Adrian, she says that her lawn by the street doesn't grow as well because of the heat from the concrete from the um, uh, heat gain. And she's considering digging up and putting in heat tolerant plants. Would you use gravel or stone there to put the plants in? She says she wants something that won't wash away like mulch. Yeah, it really kind of depends. So in that kind of scenario in the parkway or what some people call the held strip, the easiest way to prevent anything from flooding into the street, whether that be gravel or mulch, is to go ahead and rent a sod cutter or physically just use a shovel to remove the roots of the grass or any vegetation that's there. And so that brings that planting area a little bit below grade. So if it's two inches below grade, then you have, you know, room for the plants as well as a little bit of mulch or gravel. I like to use some of the no float mulch like, uh, you know, could be cedar. Um, certainly gravel would work in that scenario too, just really kind of depends on your, your personal preference there. Both of them have benefits and kind of drawbacks. In terms of plants that I would put there, um, plant, plant that could kind of go along with today's message, one of them is frog fruit. So it's a native ground cover. It grows in low light conditions as well as full sun. It is perfect for that parkway or hell strip. It produces flowers that are great for a number of our pollinators and it actually is edible. Now it doesn't necessarily taste very good, um, but it is edible. Another plant that is, it just doesn't taste bad. It just doesn't taste like anything. But another plant you might consider for that spot is, um, is horse herb. And that is a little daisy, has a little yellow flower, and that's also edible. So the leaves of frog fruit and horse herb are edible, and both of them have small little blooms and work perfect in a parkway. Um, sorry, I had to mute myself. Oh, yeah. um, we also have a question about figs. So um, Sarah says that she's tried to grow them several times and she's looking for any advice you have to successfully grow them in Texas. What variety would you suggest and what care do they need? Yeah, so um, it really de depends on personal preference. There are you know, thousands of different cultivars of figs. Traditionally, figs are very drought tolerant, very heat tolerant. They do require well-draining soil. So if you could amend the soil with compost before you plant them, if you can have uh, plant them on a slope or at least plant them a little bit higher above grade so the water kind of drains off. They don't really like freezing wet weather. So, it, you know, typically they do very, very well here without a lot of care at all. In fact, you will tend to overwater them and over maintain them, over fertilize them. And they, they kind of, they, they don't like that as much. They kind of really like to be neglected. But make sure you plant that where, where the water can run off when we do get wet weather. Um, I really love a cultivar called Violet de Bardot. Um, in fact, I have one planted kind of out the door here, but it is a compact. It's the number one rated tasting fig. It's also cold hardy to our area. In urban areas too, you may want to look at another cultivar called Little Miss Figgy. It's relatively new, but it's compact, only gets about five foot by five foot. Uh, people like brown turkey, people like um, Texas giant, um, people like the panache or the striped fig. If you go to our website, rootedin.com, and you go into kind of in the, the bar there at the top, and there's, there's free information. If you look on that, we have our 
uh, list of every fruit tree and cultivar that will grow in north central Texas. And you can download that and it lists like 15 different cultivars of fig. Um, they do die back when we get really cold weather that we got this year. They just cut back until you see green growth and it should bounce back uh, more than ever. But main thing, don't overwater it, don't over fertilize it, plant it where the water can drain away from the base. Holy cow, so much knowledge, so much knowledge in one person. Um, we have, I think, do, Georgian, do we have time for one more? Oh, you're muted. I think there's just two more questions. So if we can keep them short, Daniel, we, we'll let you answer both. Okay. Okay, so, um, uh, Cynthia has a question about American beauty berry. She says she's already lost two. Are they supposed to be hardy? They don't seem to like her clay soil. You know, funny enough, American beauty berries are actually native here to Dallas County. In fact, if you go hiking along the creeks, that's where you'll see them growing. Um, so I'm not sure what the issue, it may just be that we've had some unusual weather here getting them established, but I, I wouldn't give up. Um, I haven't had a lot of problems with them. I think main thing is making sure again that they have well draining soil. You may want to incorporate some compost in planting to kind of help with that. Um, but if you can get kind of past that early stage, um, maybe even planting them now in the spring where they can establish until we get freezing weather, they're really a, a tough plant and again, native to our to our area. Excellent, and our last question was about lizards, good or bad, how do you fall on that? Yeah, so it really depends. Most of our indigenous lizards, of course, evolved in our ecosystem. They help control, you know, pests, insects, and really serve a beneficial, there are some other lizards that are uh, not native to our area, our geckos. Um, so we see them all around our house. They, they definitely provide some benefit to controlling insects, but they may actually be competing with some of our native lizards. Um, I like them and I encourage them in my landscape. Uh, that's not my, my specialty is plants though. So you might wanna talk to somebody that's more into reptiles to get to identify uh, the, the good and the bad lizards, but I think you can probably find some resources at inaturalist.com, which is one of the resources we touched on earlier. 